beautiful. Oh, thank you. Like, it's not clean, is so it a it's emerald? usually it beautiful. is a savorite okay. garnet, is what it's called. Beautiful. How do you propose? Oh, it was awesome. It was. He's My really, other worst really proposals were. Oh, do you really? <laughs> no, he should have proposed a year earlier, and I stand by that. <laughs> ah, he went that's to Bora fair. Bora a year earlier, and he didn't propose. And oh, I, had a, I remember that trip and thinking and I had she's going to get engaged. And I had a trip. meltdown. And then we got engaged when my dad was diagnosed with brain cancer at Mayo Clinic. Oh. Literally after seeing the scans and I started crying and I was like, you're not going to be able to live to see me get married. And Ben goes, yes, you are. We're going to get married. Oh. And I was like, and then I was like, F- off. What the? F-? Like, I was so mad at everybody. This and is really like, the wrong moment. Yeah, isn't that off? I know. I mean, like, it's been whatever. And then, like, it was fine. But then my mom, when I got home, my mom got a ring out of her jewelry box. And he, like, did it when he got home. But I was like, this is not how girls imagine. Oh, you got you to gotta do this again. And I was like, why did you do this shit in Bora Bora? Totally. Totally. <laughs> On this week's episode of Citizen McCain, I'm doing a news dump with my friend Mary Catherine Hamm. Welcome back to Citizen McCain. We're very excited to have an actual real life guest here. My friend Mary Catherine Hamm, who is a longtime political analyst, True. writer, host, mom, amazing, all around, iconoclast. I mean, Thank you really you. do it all. You're <laughs> I try. Like a Swiss Army knife of political yeah. people. How long have you been doing this? Your whole life, right? Pretty much. I was a newspaper reporter for like two years, and then I came to D.C. to do policy work and then sort of stumbled into TV Yeah. at about 26 or 7 years old when I was like too dumb to know any better. <laughs> and I was like, sure, put me on camera. We'll see how it goes. And uh, it went okay. Yeah. So here I am. Yeah. This first story is going to hit both of us because we both have small children. A heated argument broke out at a Texas bar when an angry woman ripped into a fellow patron who had brought her crying baby inside the establishment. So who's in the wrong here? The mom who brought her baby to the bar or the aggressive angry woman? You have four kids. I have two. Yeah. Would you bring your baby in a bar? Absolutely. Baby in a bar is one of, I'm so glad we opened this uh, because baby in a bar is one of my favorite subjects. Um, there is a famous line from the Reese Witherspoon movie, Sweet Home Alabama, yes. where she runs into her childhood friend, Lur Lynn, uh-huh. in the bar, and she says, You have a baby in a bar. And that is a very important scene, not because we are looking down on Lur Lynn, but because Lorlin is living her life as a mother <laughs> yes. and she is enjoying herself out and about. She is not being irresponsible. And she says, I got three more at home. This one's still on the tit, so I can take him anywhere. This is not a saloon. Yeah. She's in like just a normal, this is like a Chili's type situation. This lady was calm and paying her bill. And this other woman comes over who has a real big problem with the baby. And I feel like she might be the baby in the situation. Yes. I saw a mom in a bar, even if it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm not saying anything because there's some kind of situation that brought her to that bar at 2 in the morning. And it's not sort of like violence against a child or something crazy. I'm really not getting involved. And I just don't understand why women like this are so mean to other women. I think there's an age where... They get louder and more insistent, and you should be more able to keep them from bothering other people. That gets more problematic. A, in baby phase, cry all you want. That that child is not in charge of whether he cries or not, yeah. right? He's just, it's fine. The argument when I, w- I was seeing the argument online was, she made it this lady's business when the baby cried. And I'm like, but that ends up being an argument for no babies in public spaces ever. Yeah. Because... The baby's going to cry eventually. Like, we all have to live in the world together. I took my kids out when they were young to train them in restaurants so they would be well-behaved later. Uh huh. So I took, but I took them to, like, Waffle House, right? I'm yeah. not going to be disturbing anyone at Waffle House. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and I would teach them, you sit in the booth. And if they stand in the booth, they're still going to be the best-behaved person at yeah. Waffle House. So it's okay. <laughs> yes. This one is going to hit a lot of your wheelhouses. Okay. In an op-ed piece for The Atlantic, Adam Rubenstein wrote that after admitting to enjoying Chick-fil-A sandwiches during an orientation event at The New York Times, he was rebuked by HR because of the company's notorious homophobia. Several journalists then criticized The Atlantic for publishing an obviously fake story with the Atlantic insisted that the anecdote in question was fact-checked and, quote, confirmed by New York Times employees who had contemporaneous knowledge of the incident in question. So the people who were saying this was not true uh-huh. were, like, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Okay? okay. And a couple of other, like, very left-leaning thought leaders. Yeah. Okay? I would say if I put them in a room and said, I'm going to get you guys lunch, 
and I brought them two bags of Chick-fil-A, they would call it a hate crime and try to get me fired. Uh, like, <laughs> yes. And then they're like, this could never happen. I'm like, it would happen if I gave you Chick-fil-A. Yeah. I mean, I think, first of all, the Chick-fil-A scandal happened like 10 years ago when they I, were, they yeah. gave money like against gay marriage. I think that was their thing. Look, I like love Chick-fil-A. It's my favorite. As you should. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. My, it really is my favorite. It's my favorite. <laughs> and I'm always like, I, at the time I was like, I do so much for gay marriage. You have to still give me, give me this. But I think people that think that the story isn't real haven't worked in these environments. When I was working at ABC News, I was talked to by an executive, an executive, executive producer for wearing an Elvis sweatshirt because it was offensive to her because Elvis uh, stole rock and roll from black people. And it became like a whole thing. And again, like if you don't want to eat Chick-fil-A, that's your choice, that's fine. But you shouldn't be reported to HR. No, and if you're having this, you're onboarding, right? You're joining this organization. This is what this was. Yeah. And a bunch of people gang up to finger snap an acclamation yes. about snap. how you have done a hate crime by eating chicken. You're going to recognize immediately what line you need to tow. Yeah. And what you need to do to move forward. And that is what causes the conformity of major yeah. media. Like, this is a bullying environment. Ironically, they would not see themselves as bullies. They see themselves as saviors. But that's what that is. Yeah. It was always hard for me to understand how, like, these things, like eating Chick-fil-A, raised the level of HR. And then at the same time, it, like, belittles really serious HR things. Yes. Where it's, like, things that actually deserve to go to HR. And I found, in, and it's not just like ABC when I worked at, but any kind of like corporate media space, there is this feeling of like, I just have to shut the f up because I don't want to get fired. No. And yeah, I course. don't want to be harassed. Of course. Like, I have worked in media organizations where it was my job to be the voice that is different. Yeah. And yeah, you're yet, the token Republican. You lot. know the whole time that if you just say the thing everyone else is saying, guess what? You'll get more airtime. You'll get more airtime. You, won't, pay you more. won't have people coming after you. You won't have people questioning your every word because you're on the opposite side. Yeah. But that's not healthy for the organization. No, it's not healthy for And me I think either. the people who are in those conformity bubbles eventually have no idea how conformist the situation is. They're yeah. just like, oh, I'm just, oh, we're just doing the thing. We're being fair centrists over here. You're no, not. They're not. I teach on college campuses sometimes. And one of the things I do that I wish more college professors did, I'm a right leaning person. I know they don't agree with me yeah. about everything, but I tell them outright, please disagree with me. It does not scare me. Unless you give people that invitation, they do not feel comfortable with it. We are social they animals. How respond to you? Uh, they usually, I've had really good experiences on college campuses for the most part. I think they're more f friendly than I would have expected most of the time. I do feel like there's, you, you may have gotten this before too, there's the, the person who thinks they're asking you a question you've never been asked yes, before. Yes. And they're like, how are you a woman? Yeah but also conservative. And I'm like, ooh, well, I've never thought about this. Thank you for your question. <laughs> All I'm being told every day if you live in a major city is Republicans are evil, you're the worst. If you're a woman especially, you're a gender traitor, traitor right. blah, 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 blah. Like every second of my life is just a stimuli of how everything I believe is the wrong thing to believe. But if you're a cushy liberal, you are walk out of your house and you're like, you're on the side of truth. No, you're affirmed you're, all the time. <laughs> you're on the side of democracy. You are beautiful, yeah. special, sparkly snowflake angel. Yeah. And I'm the devil. And that is what it is like being a Republican working in any other place except Fox And Band. it's not good for thinking. And what has happened which scares me and scares you because we're somehow still somewhat normal, is that the radical people on the far right have gotten so much more attention because it feeds into these conspiracy theories that everybody's being, you know, deplatformed and silenced. That's where you see that spin out. I sometimes joke that like the left and the right end up in these, uh, yeah. they're, they're opposing whirlpools yes, totally. of crazy. Yeah. And then in the middle, like all the normies are just drowning. Like, can y'all please act normal? And nobody can act normal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's just, it's bad for thinking. It's bad for rational rational evaluation of issues. I think during COVID, you saw all this tribalism make us really bad at deciding what actually was dangerous and what was not. Yeah. So it has costs yeah. for society if we can't actually sit around and discuss a full yeah. like balance of the facts. This is part of existing in the world too, right? Is yeah. that I don't want every single one of my decisions to have to be vetted with a thorough 
research of every single CEO and who they gave money to. I don't want to live like that. Also, I just want to eat the chicken. If you and I only consume things that were like like minded, oh I mean, like who do I have? It's you like can watch one movie. Totally Sorry, like, who one do movie. I have to watch? Like, what? <laughs> Someone was like, "Why do you still watch?" I was watching something. I was watching um, a, a Sean Penn movie, and my brother was giving me shit about it. I was like, "He's a good actor." No, okay. <laughs> if, you, if you only watch things or listen to things that reflect your beliefs, good luck out there because yeah. that's not going to happen for you if you're right of center. I totally agree. Find a way to appreciate art without that. I totally agree. Okay, the next one is, this is a little spicy. So Andy Cohen allegedly, according to Leah McSweeney, favors fellow substance users. So there's a lawsuit filed by Leah McSweeney of the Real Housewives of New York that claims Andy Cohen's proclivity for using cocaine with employees is, quote, a failure to accommodate employees who are disabled and attempting to remain substance-free. The suit also claims that Cohen, quote, flatters housewives with whom he uses cocaine with more favorable treatments and edits. So there's like a lot of lawsuits wow. about, and it's intense. Yeah. It's a lot of lawsuits at Bravo right now. For whatever it's worth, a bunch of housewives have come out in defense saying yeah. that they have not done drugs with him. I guess Real Housewives is a situation where cocaine might come up in a work setting, yes. right? So that's apparently different. Vander- it's different. It's not like they're at a call center. Apparently you know? Vanderpump rules. There's, I, again, I've, this is a part of me that I guess is super conservative. I've never yeah. touched a drug in my life. Um, I'm very proud of that. My mother is a recovered addict, and I think I was just mm-hmm. like always too scared. But um, apparently on Vanderpump, they look like they're coked out a lot. Oh. I mean, I don't want to get in legal trouble and like accuse someone of whatever, but apparently. Allegedly. allegedly <laughs> and this is why I always thought cancel culture was interesting for things like Bravo. Right. When your whole business is set on the model of like very problematic people with very problematic behavior. <laughs> How do you continue? And now there's all these lawsuits. Well, and that's part of the part of the problem is that problematic people are interesting. Totally right? interesting. And so one of the reasons to I think one of the reasons to err like on the side of airing opinions uh, is because it allows people to deal with a lot of different facts and a lot of different personalities in the world as it is. Um, but also like people are interesting. People are interesting. And if they're sanitized, they're not as interesting. Do you watch reality TV? Yes. What do you Although watch? I gotta say, these days I'm not so caught up because I just have too many children to, yeah. to do it. 5,000 children, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the next one is, you and I are obsessed with this. Kate Middleton has not seen pub- been publicly since Christmas Day. On January 17th, Kensington Palace announced that she had entered the hospital for planned abdominal surgery and was unlikely to resume public duties until Easter. But on February 27th, when Prince William canceled a planned appearance due to a, quote, personal matter, rumors and conspiracies began to circulate. Conspiracies include that they're getting divorced, that she was induced to into a coma after abdominal surgery, as was reported on a Spanish TV show. My personal favorite is that she got a Brazilian butt lift. She's growing out her bangs. Or she's she became the villain in the viral Willy Wonka experience. It is worth noting there was a very blurry photo yeah. that came out of her yesterday. Yes. Driving. Yes, with her mom, first of all. Looks like it was taken from the moon. It's like yeah. the blurriest photo ever. Yeah, and she's got shades on. There, there's a whole other conspiracy. At any time you have That's one of her. these incidents, like, is that her? Yeah. Right? First of all, I hope she is well. I yeah, want her of to course. Work. Yeah, like, I just... It sounds like it's very serious. Whatever yeah. is going on is very serious. Um, but like to that point, two weeks in a hospital is a very serious yes. matter. Like a C-section is what ninety six hours should probably be longer. By, yeah. by the way, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But like that's a major abdominal surgery, and you're out of the hospital within days, right? Yeah. I'm concerned that there is something very serious going on, and I hope to see her reemerge. Like majestically yeah. at Easter, which is when they say she would be back to doing things. Like, I really like Kate Middleton and I really like Prince William. I got really sick of um, Harry and Meghan. I was a big fan of Harry and Meghan in the beginning. That's understating it. I was the same. I was like, I want to like you. I want to yeah. like you. You're not helping me like you. The fact that I know that Harry has an uncircumcised penis because he told me, yeah. you gave me that information through your book that you yeah. had to put cream on because you got frostbite before the wedding. Like, all this, I know where and how you lost your virginity. Yeah. I know which sexual position you did when you lost your virginity. I didn't ask for this. The information that was given to me by Harry and Forced his book. Forced upon me. Yes. And when it came out, I was like, <laughs> I don't know what I've done. I was like, I was on your side. Tradwick. Oh, I know. <laughs> From behind. No. He, quote, mounted her like a stallion. <laughs> I had to. I had she to. She knew for, yeah. for real, for real. Wow, she you knew. Had that, I you had, had that to ready to go. I was working quote. at the Daily Mail at the time, and I had to read it. And they got an early copy because a copy was accidentally released in Spain. Yes. And they had someone translate it to read. And that part was originally taken, like eventually taken out. No. Oh, that's so in all. Oh no. 
I really just don't like them. I think they're like the worst examples of our generation's entitlement and like, I don't buy any of it. So I became more protective of William and Kate because I was like, they're still working. Like at least they're still trying to keep that royal family together. You have an amazing podcast. I have a podcast yesterday when I was sending my notes in. It was in big bold letters, Biden shit polling. (laughs) And it was (laughs) Donald Trump, according to this recent New York Times Siena poll, Donald Trump leads Joe Biden 48 to 43% among registered voters. 43% said Joe Biden's policies hurt them personally compared to 40% who said Donald Trump's policies helped them personally. Only 66% of black voters and 40% of Hispanic voters say that they would vote for Biden. 46% of Hispanic voters said that they would vote for Trump. By comparison, Obama's support among black voters is 95%. That's crazy. And then 54% of college voters would vote for Biden compared to 38% of Trump. There's a lot to unpack, but these are Biden shithole numbers. These numbers are not good. So bad. No one can fool themselves about these. Well, no, that's not true. Some people will try to fool themselves about these numbers. Jen Psaki will fool herself. Look, <laughs> that's not, they could change. Yeah. These numbers it. are terrible. And you're talking about going up against Trump, one of the most unpopular figures in the country. But the fact is that how... I'm not even going to do the numbers. How the economy felt for people on a daily basis during his presidency, yeah. accepting COVID, which a lot of people just bracket off as super weird in 2020, right? It felt better than what people are experiencing now. I think a lot of it is the inflation. I think a lot of people blame him for it. I happen to think rightly so because of all the spending. And you getting around that's going to be very tough. Yeah. Because they both have a record now. He ran against Trump without a record. Yeah. Now this is the record. Can I ask you about, I think that the black vote and Hispanic vote are like daunting numbers. Mm -hmm. Only 66% of black voters said that they would vote for Biden. Again, 95% of black voters voted for Obama. That is a, I mean, 30% deficit. How did that happen? I mean, I'm actually really shocked by those numbers. You think it's just the economy's stupid? It's the old adage. I think it's because the spending, spending money on groceries hurts a lot. And it hurts more than it used to. And the thing about black voters and Hispanic voters, Trump will win some of those voters. Yeah. I think Democrats are really good at getting out unenthusiastic voters. They've yes. shown they can do that. But these numbers mean that a lot of the, those black voters don't, or those Hispanic voters don't have to cross over. Yeah. They just have to stay home in a certain number. And then it's very dangerous in battleground states. So what's interesting about this is 40% of Hispanic voters said they won't vote for Biden. 46% of Hispanic voters said that they will vote for Trump. So Trump is leading with the Hispanic vote, which was supposed to be this like white rhino myth that was never going to happen for Republicans. And I can remember at my old job, working with Hispanic women, where this was just a, I mean, like an absolute unfathomable situation that, because, you know, all Republicans are racist. Um, What do you make of, I mean, I cannot believe the Hispanic vote is is up for grabs the way it is. I think that it is, a lot of Hispanic voters are working class. Yeah. There's a lot of pain in that economic bracket right now. That's part of it. Part of it is you've seen movement on this in uh, places like border towns yeah. in Texas, where like heavily Democratic districts that are heavily Hispanic have gone another direction because this chaos on the border. So I think that is an issue that counterintuitively yeah. ends up sending people away from Biden because liberals think, oh, no, no, nobody would be mad about this. Like they're everyone's Hispanic here. And it's like, well, first of all, this is not a monolith. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not actually how it works in practice. I also think Hispanic voters are not a monolith, which yeah. Democrats never understand. There's a big difference between like Mexican Americans and Cuban Americans yes. and whatever. I think my take on it is two things. Number one, a lot of Hispanic people have come to this country fleeing socialism. Yes. And Democrats have been like, yay, socialism, socialism is the best for us. It's not a great message. It's horrible. The other thing (laughs) is a lot of Hispanic people who have migrated here, they came here because they want to be American. They're proud to be American. They want to be part of the American dream. Yes. And always, and if your message is we're going to be just like the country you fled and you shouldn't be proud to be here. And Hispanic people tend to be more religious and more family oriented. That is a, a that is a large part of it too. And yeah. I think the real, like, you know, if Democrats are going to be the party of like anti-religion and anti-family, this is where it's going to land. Um, I actually only know one Hispanic person who's a Democrat. That may just be like anecdotally my bubble I'm in, mm-hmm. but most Hispanic people I know, especially in Arizona, are like hardcore Republicans, 
and a big part of it is the so like to say that socialism has been like so repellent to yes. this demographic. I don't understand how you can't understand if like yeah. Cuba. Why would a Cuban not be okay with socialism? I wonder why. Yeah, it's wonder a bad why message. Miami Dade is now a Republican. Yeah, that's another <laughs> that's another county that's like wow, mind yeah. blowing. I think you know these are. These are trouble numbers. I don't know how Democrats come up from this. And people like me, like I already made two videos. I'm not voting for Trump or Biden. I'm not voting for RFK Jr. either. Everybody keeps asking that. I'm not I know this that. is, uh, you're, we're in the same place. You and I are just, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to write Mary Catherine it. I really will if that's what you want. <laughs> I'm still going to vote. Like I'm going to vote down ballot it's important. Yeah. But you and I are, are unique outliers. Oh, there's going to be a lot of people that, you know, will still like begrudgingly vote for Trump. For sure. And there's a lot of people who will begrudgingly vote for Biden. Although I do think there is something to this disaffected voter at the top of the ticket. Yeah. Um, because I, I uh, sat on the um, on the train to New York like two weeks ago and two ladies got on in, in Philly, like from the, um, out, from the collar counties of Philadelphia, which is very important for any election, uh -huh. right? Suburban moms from the collar counties yeah. of Philadelphia. And they were on a day trip together playing hooky, going, having yeah, some yeah. fun in New York. And they sit across from me and they break out like little mini champagne bottles. <laughs> they offer me one. We get to talking. It's amazing. <laughs> and they're, they, you know, they were saying, and this is the demographic that matters. It's so discouraging. I'm not sure I'll even vote. A lot of people are going to react that way. These are some things I prepped to make my week just a little bit easier. Nara Smith and her husband, Lucky, are young influencers and models with a large following on TikTok. Though Nara is a trad wife and that she prepares elaborate meals for her family and seemingly emphasizes her role as a wife and mother above all things, she isn't what you'd expect a typical trad wife to be. From Rolling Stone, in one video she wears a gown while making Cocoa Puffs from scratch. In another, she makes Lucky homemade cookies and cream from frozen yogurt. She makes the daily drudgery of motherhood and household labor look not just easy, but impossibly sexy. Okay, I'm gonna admit something to you. I follow Nara Smith. I've been following Nara Smith for a while. I like Nara Smith. Just bear with me. A, it's completely aspirational insanity. Right. I could never, my version of cooking, I literally do, I'm a big slow cooker person. Yep, like I put it. stuff in a crock pot before I leave for them. Like I do it like for stuff like this because we work all day yeah. and it'll work. You stuff to do. I like her. I don't think this is meant to be real. No, I think I, it's meant yes. to be a fantasy. And I also think that like, at least she's like a different kind of person. Normally the women who are doing this are like very white, very blonde and wearing Lululemon. And she's wearing these like exotic outfits that are like fur and whatever. She's stunningly beautiful. She's a model. And also I like this like biracial couple with her like voice and their kids. She's like a nice voice. I, wa I yeah. like her and I watch it. I am nothing like her. So I, I think that's key. Think this is toxic? The key to the trad wife experience, if you were observing it, yeah. from the outside, as I will always be, because I cannot do this. Um, although I'd love to do that uh, as my like gig, yeah. right? Uh, is that you have to understand that it is not a real thing that is happening there yeah. in the way that it might be presented by some. And I don't think she's presenting it as realistic. Nara Smith also isn't shoving her politics on me, which some trad wife people do, where yeah. they're like, have 10,000 kids, only be like the wife who never works and never has any ambitions for anything, and this is how life is supposed to be. I don't like Ballerina Farm because her husband's family owns JetBlue. Right, so we have she, to be honest about yes. that part of it. She's a $50,000 yeah. oven and like 10 kids, and she gave birth to her kid and then or competed in a beauty pageant like two or three yeah, weeks I after. Yeah, saw that. And like that's not, for me, like that's a, Nara Smith I, I'm fine with because again, I think she's presenting a fantasy and she's a model and she's not doing day-to-day -day grind hustling like you and me with commentary and politics. But I, I actually really, for some reason, I'm very like, I always call myself like a third wave feminist. I think having daughters makes you that way right. too. Like, I like working. I married a conservative man who also likes that he's with a woman who works. Yes, I, I'm also you in too. that situation, yes. But I really like Nora Smith. Isn't that weird? I do like her. I think I think it's about it's about understanding what you're consuming and understanding that the the trad wife gig is a job, by the way. Yeah. Like they're like, never work a job, only serve your husband and children. I'm like, you do hours of edited yeah. content. That also, you can't do that without getting paid for it. Right. At the time. Right. Yeah. So I think just knowing what you're getting. And if you're looking for relatable mom content, there's that too. The other thing I don't like about the trad wife conversation and the way that it goes online is that it is how much it underestimates men. Yes. Right. It's like, no, men should do only this one thing, which is make money and then come home. And then, you know, you're not supporting yeah. on the home front in any other way than that monetary way, which is how some of that gets framed. My husband is very masculine and very competent and his competence, which is part of being like an admirable man, 
allows him to do a lot of things well, yeah. including take care of children. Yeah, yeah. Why are we mad at that? All right, thank you again so thank much. You. And uh, come back to my web show anytime. Of course. <laughs> Thanks for watching Citizen McCain.